Okay, well, yeah, welcome everyone. Um, looks like folks are starting to add their uh, names to the attendance list. Thanks for doing that. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I think uh, there are several several folks who may um, be may have been keeping an eye on DNA storage uh, for way longer than I have. <laughs> Gave myself a little bit of a crash course uh, just going through these articles, and it's been super interesting. Um, so what I actually did was uh, I listed out uh, a few different talking points for the discussion. Um, we could start with those if we wanted to. Um, please, by all means, if anyone has additional points that they would like to uh, add there, go for it. Um, but before we get into that, um, yeah, Leah, is there, do we want to go over the any co-chairs news or anything like that first? Um, uh, well, I think we, I'm, I'm pleased just to report that we did get um, a person who was interested in co-chairing with Eric next year, and that's Robin Rugber from the University of Virginia. And I'm pretty sure got that right. Anyway, uh, so um, we'll be over the next couple months transitioning. I'll be transitioning off. She'll be transitioning on. So uh, we're very grateful to Robin for being willing to do that. Yeah, it'll be great to have Robin. Uh, hope so. And then do you want to talk about next month, Eric? Yeah, um, just briefly, uh, I, you know, it, it's, <clears throat> it's our intention to uh, make a presentation about um, adding, basically add, trans, adding transparency to repository operations. It's uh, something that we've been doing at CDL for Merit, um, but it is really, I think it can be very applicable to, um, you know, um, lots of different folks. Uh, it's, it's mainly about uh, discussing the variety of reports and operations we've been trying to build into a tool that surfaces information for us on a daily basis. Um, it gives us more, you know, more information to uh, report to our stakeholders, to our users, um, and also to us. Uh, so we can be in the know of anything going on at any given time during the repository in terms of, you know, ingests or replication or fixity checking, all that sort of thing. So um, yeah, look forward to working on that for next month. And I see that Robin has joined us. So Robin, I just wanted to let you know that I uh, let the group know that you have volunteered to co-chair for the coming year. Do you have anything you'd like to say about any of that? Yes, I just came up with a brand new desktop because I had a laptop failure, <laughs> but I'm really glad to be um, connected back in with the infrastructure group and given back to NDSA. It's been a while since I've been really involved and I'm looking forward to it. And we're grateful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And then for our December meeting, we're uh, tentatively thinking that it's probably the uh, good time to to make that a planning meeting for the coming year, seeing as um, you know there's a lot of people who are not around in December. So, but if you are planning on being at the December meeting, if you could start thinking now about um, not just topics, but uh, any any thoughts that you have about how the infrastructure group is is working, what you like, what maybe what you don't like. Uh, so all kinds of things that could be discussed in December about the about moving forward with the in with the interest group. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, we tend to, I mean, I think that, yeah, that meeting is going to be right the week before thing, I, the, week, <laughs> the week before Christmas or something like that. So yeah. um, if you can make it great, that'd be wonderful. Um, uh, you know, we, we were thinking about actually creating another poll um, in terms of topics, uh, but as you all have, uh, I'm, I'm sure, noticed, we've also been trying to mix it up in terms of the types of meetings that we have, uh, whether they're kind of open meetings, whether they're presentations uh, or discussions like this one uh, that we're trying out. So uh, again, any, any new ideas with regard to 
the meeting format are always welcome also. That's all I can okay. think of. I don't know if you have other housekeeping things. No, don't think so. All right. Alrighty. Um, so yeah, let's let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I kind of wanted to uh, get a quick sense of who is able to uh, take a look at, at the videos um, or do some reading. Um, so I don't know if uh, folks would be interested in putting up their hands to see who did what. Um, but apart from that, um, yeah, I, um, I'd like to just kind of like open it up and ask if, um, if there are any um, like immediate takeaways or topics or points of the discussion that you'd like to cover. Uh, and then also, um, you know, we can get into that list of items that I mentioned there. So anybody like to jump in right off the bat? I'd be curious to know more. I, I had a hard time getting a sense of sort of the nitty gritty of not the scientific part because there was certainly plenty of science in those things in the various sources, but just what what it what it is, what it looks like. Is it a liquid? Is it a solid? I mean, it would just be interesting to, and you know, I think there are a couple of people on the on the group who are actually working with it. So I'd just be curious to find out more about what what the material handling part of this is all is like. And we don't have to do that right off, but in general, it would be kind of interesting, I think. Trying to wrap my head around it and starting with the most tangible <laughs> concepts. Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you and I gone into some of that a little bit and kind of showed, showed us the uh, different, um, well, he showed us some imagery of the um, tests that they had done there. Um, but it's, you know, from, from that, uh, from the presentation, it sounds like there's a process of, you know, removing any kind of uh, air that's in between the samples, like within the seal, of, you know, the, whatever is sealing the, yeah. um, well, everything. And yeah. In one of the, in one of the presentations, I mean, they talk about tubes and things. In one of the presentations, there was a visual of a card with dots and I didn't, and uh, in one of the, I think the paper, it talked about how, uh, a, a liquid medium um, was somehow easier to work with. So I just wasn't sure. When I think of DNA, I, you know, there are lots of forms that you can get DNA in. And I just didn't know if there was something emerging as the, the standard practice with this. And I'll admit that I didn't watch everything I've read some of the paper and the thing that I've always wondered about this is this came up a little bit at the Library of Congress storage meeting several years ago but even though you're making a lot of copies if you've got all those copies in one place obviously there's a risk there but I wonder what other kinds of risks there are for this type of storage let's say from uh, radiation or or other kinds of biological uh, factors. You know, I haven't seen anything talking about the different kinds of risk and measures you should take with this kind of storage. Well, so I think there's that. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say one sense that I got was that uh, because making copies is so easy and inexpensive that uh, somehow that's a major part of the strategy. It's interesting. I had not thought about something like radiation. That's an interesting thought. But, uh, you know, they talk about error rates and it being relatively high and that it seems like having massive numbers of copies seems to be. Also, I thought it was interesting in one of the, in one of the sources it talked about how once you resequence it that you you have lost that copy because it gets washed away. So yeah, it's a it's interesting interesting ideas that um, Linda had brought up in her presentation, um, just in terms of like the requirements for digital preservation uh, that specifically that we would have um, for DNA storage. Uh, you know, and, and it's I think like one of the things that really stuck with me was that for for 
her organization for digital bedrock, I mean, they're, they're spending so much time on uh, the initial like capturing of the metadata, um, making sure they can capture preservation actions, um, anything that happens uh, during that process. And then they, you know, of course, like one of the final steps is, is moving the content and storing it into uh, whichever, whichever storage, um, either cloud storage, on-prem, all that sort of thing. Um, and there's this kind of, um, I think it, it, it's really the thought of having a tiered, um, you know, storage approach or policy that's in place that would enable you to say, okay, DNA storage is really kind of like the, the last stop. And we're not going to be, um, you know, we, we're basically uh, going to go through the synthesis process. We're not going to be sequencing this. We're expecting that, you know, the the error correction uh, that's built into every single sample is, you know, going to save us from seeing a, a large number of errors, or at least errors that might go similar errors that might correlate across samples, that sort of thing. Um, but it just felt like there was that disconnect right there. You know, it's like we're we're used to, you know, migrating file formats. We're used to saying, okay, you know, we're we're going to be able to detect which formats need to be migrated. Um, we have all this metadata and ways of capturing actions, but we're not really going to be able to do that with DNA storage at all. Um, you know, we'll be able to do that with our other copies, and maybe those other copies are distributed. Um, and, but then, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I, I think that goes back, Robin, to what you were saying, is that where do those copies reside? And um, with regard to the actual medium, the actual, like, um, you know, DNA backup or DNA storage bag, like copy that you have, do you, do you let the organization like twist hang on to that forever or at least for a long time? Do you have, uh, do you take those samples on yourself and, or have, you know, another organization do that for you? Um, you know, that's, those are kind of open questions out there. On the other hand, I think one thing that uh, the twist presentation did kind of like hit home for me was that this is DNA and this is, you know, sequencing DNA is something that we should always be able to do. Um, and it doesn't really matter what organization does that for you in, in the long run. And if we can't do that 200 years from now, a thousand years from now, then yeah, what, why did we do it in the first place? That sort of thing. Um, but Right, it's, you know, at least from that standpoint, like being able to sequence and, re, you know, obtain what you put into the system isn't a concern, at least, um, or at least it shouldn't be a concern. Um, One of the things that I, that, that this sparked me to think about, because I'm in the middle of doing some bulk moves of, of archival master, files and in getting the whole scenario figured out there have been a couple times where i've had to change file names or do something like that and so the idea of really having an end product that will not change at all is to me harder than it seems and uh i know that linda in hers in her presentation talked a little bit about sort of being able to right into the DNA. So doing a fixity check of some sort or something where now this it needs to be changed in one way or another and and how challenging that aspect is with DNA storage. Right. Right. So involving something like se sequencing and then you know another round of synthesis. Another yeah. of course, you know, everything that goes into that. Um, and then, you know, maybe standards have changed or something in terms of like, yeah. um, the strand length, the DNA strand length or the density of the information that's in there or the error correction and all, like all the, yeah, it's just suddenly you might be reworking through the process 10 years, 20 years down the road, and hopefully it will have gotten much better. Um, and they, you know, because they tout the, especially twist, you know, they tout how, you know, this can last for thousands of years, 
but our concept of how we want to use it changes. And so the idea that something would actually remain static for that long is hard for me to imagine. So it really, even though it's capable of, of lasting that long, would we actually realistically keep something that long without it changing at all? And so mm -hmm. it's an interesting idea. I was, I was very pessimistic about this technology in the last meeting. I think there's a lot of issues with it. Um, one that I did end up talking to some people about was whether the errors are correlated in the uh, writing stage. And the answer is yes, they're highly correlated. Mm -hmm. There are some sequences that are much more likely to get flipped than others. Um, and, you know, I've looked at some of the projects that did larger scale DNA storage. Like there was one company that um, they wrote all of Wikipedia to DNA. And in their test, they had a, they were bragging about a 99.9% .9 accuracy rate, but having a 0.1% error rate is horrific. Like we couldn't rely on that. And then on the, on the subject of like long-term storage, when you're dealing with something like block storage, you can be actively monitoring it to see if your bits have flipped and then you can correct that. You can't do that with DNA. Right. If it fails, you have no idea that it failed. You'd have to resequence it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which which from the standpoint that, that makes you, yeah, it, right. It's, it's kind of like that, like knee jerk reaction, like, nope, that won't work. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I remember you mentioning the correlation of the, like of the errors uh, in the last meeting when you and it's here. And it's just, I, I just, I, I wonder how, and given the scale that they're they're trying to work at, work out, like Twist is trying to work out, um, where like one sheet of samples is like what one million different samples instead of like you know ten thousand or something like that. Um, yeah, I could totally agree, Robin. You're, you're just being discerning. You're not being pessimistic. <laughs> um, you know, they're talking about working at a gigabyte level where it takes them like two or three hours to. Uh, to work through a gigabyte worth of data now, um, then they're going to hopefully scale up to a terabyte. Um, but yeah, I just I just feel like if they can't get some of the error correction and handling under control, you know, what will it mean to be able to, you know, synthesize, you know, a terabyte worth of information and not be able to confirm how well it went um, without doing a lot more work. So oh yeah, there's a so you mentioned top seeds, 120 gigabytes a day in 2019. Okay. Yeah, I, that, I, that was a private company that had bragged about it in a CNET article that got linked through one of the papers. So I don't I take that with a grain of salt. But I actually thought that Linda's presentation was in some ways the most interesting because we really ought not to care what the backend medium is so long as it satisfies all those requirements. And this is just something where maybe the technology catches up in 10 or 20 years and then we can take advantage of it. But I don't know. It almost seems like, are we really driving that tech? No, it's. Yeah. But doesn't that kind of fly in the face of us not wanting to put like every copy into the same technology? So in some yeah. ways we have to be concerned mm -hmm. about the back end. That's a good point. I mean, yeah. DNA gives us another option for something like a lot of the disk drives are made by the same manufacturers. So it's hard. You know, if you're going to put something to disk, not to have the same technology, even if you're going with two different providers. But in some respects, I think we have to be concerned. That's interesting to mull over. Yeah, I mean, when I've thought of that in the past, it's mostly to try to segment what, um, like, in what ways you could fail and like lose all of your backup copies, and if you did have. Like suppose that the, the technology worked perfectly and you had these immutable copies of DNA distributed geographically around the world, in what situation would they all fail together? I don't know, maybe, that, maybe the odds of that happening are low enough that you don't really care even at that point, especially if it's a disaster recovery copy. I think, Dan, you know, one interesting point that sort of spins off of that, though, is the one way that they could fail is if the technology for the ECC or index layers change so radically that it invalidates all of your all of your physical copies. That sort of because um, I, I found myself initially really excited about this as just something bizarre, right? 
Um, but the more, I, I, I don't know, you're winning me over, Dan. Uh, the more I've, I've, I've thought about this, I, I think that it's something to be really aware of and, and like engage in a, in a constructively skeptical way. Because I think that what's driving the conversation right now is largely the sort of disruptive startup talk, which is like, this is gonna transform the world. It's gonna do all of these things. But some of those other moments are really key for us, right? Because it doesn't matter if you can store things at a high density, if you lose control over those keys, because then it's just, it's just DNA, right? Like we don't understand what it is. We can't actually unpack it in an effective way regardless. So I think that's the, the level at which you could have um, uh, a sort of a catastrophic loss of data because the keys would be, you know, out of date. Yeah, the, one of the points that the advocates for this make is that, well, the API for DNA is like, it underpins all of life on earth so that that is not gonna change. But what you got me thinking of, what I think is a really good point is, you know, we can get off the shelf hardware to do sequencing or, well, not sequencing, but to pull data off of drives whenever you want but not a lot of companies can actually do the sequencing. So you might have a risk there of just having to rely on specific suppliers. That could also be a risk. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and in that sense, I didn't think it was all that different. You know, recently there was an article in The Verge about um, Harvard doing some encoding of, of data using dyes. So not like DNA, but like dye techniques and so forth like that. And it was sort of, you know, uh, there was some skepticism, I think, you know, with regard to the technology being too specific or too proprietary or something like that. But I'm not struck by, by the fact that some of this DNA stuff isn't all that different, that there could be really proprietary layers here or there, even though it is the quote building blocks of life. So. Right. And then I mean, based on based on that, I mean, there's so there's proprietary technology there, but then there's also like on the other side of the spectrum, like, you know, in the, um, where it should just always be a possibility to, to sequence DNA. It's like, where will we hit like chemical limitations or, you know, literally like limitations the industry has already been experiencing for quite a while. Like, are we gonna hit any like chemical or physical like limitations that we can't get past? Um, and that's that's a big general question, but um, yeah, that, that kind of sits in the back of my mind as well. And this may be sci-fi e, but you know, in this era, it's hard to not think about things like viruses and mutations and things like that. Was is there danger in the very long term uh, of the very biochemical reactions that they use to to justify it, are there actually threats because of the natural biochemical realities? Right, right. Yeah, there are things we just haven't thought of yet <laughs> that are gonna come up. That guano changing all of our data. <laughs> Viruses <laughs> with that guano. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, you know, some of the other, the other sticking points for me, um, or at least just very interesting things, having read through these materials, um, and I, I'm thinking about the, uh, the, the paper um, that they, they showcase like a lot of the different trade-offs with regard to, um, you know, payload size, strand length, density, error correction. Um, and then they attempted to like actually scale that up to the point where we could store all the data in the world, 175 zettabytes by 2025 or something like that. Um, and yeah, the scaling factor has actually made a big dent in that making that feasible. Um, but you know, when you when you think about how each one of those factors interacts and being able to actually um, determine where the sweet spots are. I think that's that's going to be a whole lot of work that I'm sure, you know, Twist and other companies are already like working through right now. But um, 
you know, that, that's there, there are a lot of variables in the mix. Um, but if we go, you know, even with those variables, I think there are some, you know, kind of looking at the, this discussion points list, I think there's some things that are consistent uh, in terms of the approaches, like being able to provide random access, being able to like actually locate the data that you want to locate um, because of the presence of the primers and the index and everything like that. And like that, all of that sort of, all those sorts of things really, um, you know, really make sense and seem like they shouldn't have to change very much. Um, <clears throat> Just looking through some of the other points here. One, uh, while you're looking here, just one point that I found to be fascinating that I hadn't thought about before was the fact that you might be consuming drops of solution every time you retrieve content. Mm. That that was something they alluded to in the article and I hadn't thought about that. That just sort of gives you a finite number of reads. Uh, and, and again, not, not, not as a sort of skeptical thing, it's just like an interesting way of thinking about this medium because um, it, it's, it's different in that way than LTO or you know, other sorts of gear that you might be working with. Right, I mean, there's only so much, so much solution there where the DNA is, is you know, present and once it's gone, it's gone. I hadn't thought of that at all. Um, and I guess we don't really, we don't think about that in terms of conventional storage either. I mean, we, we sort of do because eventually magnets wear down and other things wear down and tape wears down, but um, it happens so much less. I mean, the number of reads you can get from any sort of storage nowadays are, you know, we just, yeah, it's not concerning from that standpoint. Um, we also have lots of good software that identifies that and tells us. Right, exactly. When something's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, and all of the automation that's in place in terms of, you know, <clears throat> fixing checking and, and automatically migrating and moving things to devices that, you know, at least in cloud storage where we don't, we're not even aware of that happening all the time, but it happens all the time. Um, you know, looking through these points, I think one, one of the other things that um, uh, that Linda mentioned and also that uh, was mentioned in the twist presentation was just uh, the long term cost um, of DNA storage versus you know the long term costs of of conventional storage, and that that to me was kind of it it made a like a it was something I was thinking of going in, but um, you know just literally like seeing. Some of the, um, you know, just a couple of the the tables that they had there, and the discussion. Well, you know, initially there might be a larger cost or more significant cost. Maybe that goes down as well over the over time. But um, yeah, once everything has been synthesized, um, yeah, uh, it's just cost of DNA storage is much, much more of a a level and known. Uh, Kind of a, a known value versus um, conventional storage over the long run. Except I think that's where, so it was the one hour of video that would pay off, it would equal out after 10 years. And so I think that's where the discussion that we were having about do we actually have data that we, that would actually remain stable for long enough uh, where we would want it to stay stable long enough to pay for itself, or you know, does information science itself change rapidly enough that after ten years there isn't something that we would want to fundamentally change about that data that's being stored that we would incur a cost all over again anyway? And would it, playing devil's advocate, would it ever actually pay itself off? Right. I mean, and they're they're definitely policy changes that are happening there you know it's like a, you, you have to get back to to just that core principle of no we don't want to preserve everything we we need to be selective and 
um, having DNA storage in the mix with, uh, you know, a tiered storage approach, um, then all of a sudden, right, you have to really kind of, you know, go back and reconsider um, and think about what's going to make it all the way to DNA storage, what is not going to make it, you know, is there, and I, I always think, start, from that standpoint, I always start thinking about research data. And I think that, you know, there's more opportunity for a policy to get to research, you know, to, to frame research data and different types of research data, uh, you know, at, at, for, for having different requirements and, you know, yeah. being preserved for 10 years, being preserved for 20 years, how much is this going to be, how can we, can we depend on this being leverageable 10 or 15 years from now? Does that mean we shouldn't be keeping it anymore? Um, so I think there's, there are more variables there with research data and that's why it comes to mind. Um, but uh, I just want to take a look at one of the comments in, that Cal just made the most, most vital window is when we can still bootstrap the representation network, the o OAIS. Yeah. Once the representations are meaningless, they need to be changed or supplemented and thus written to a new medium. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, our field will change. Information science will change. Models will change. Thinking about how hard it's been to align around standards. Um, it's not that people haven't tried, it's just we have a hard time getting there. But I guess, you know, the good thing about, you know, even our conversation right here is like, you know, when somebody, um, tells you that something could be stored in DNA for hundreds, thousands of years, um, you know, it really does make you step back and think, um, what does that mean to the, the field of digital preservation? Um, then it's, yeah, it's just thought provoking. Um, the, you know, one other, an, another standpoint of, uh, or another, another um, observation here is, uh, you know, how much data you can actually store in uh, a single gram of DNA versus, uh, you know, how, mu how much data you end up storing in physical conventional drives nowadays and how much, you know, how much energy, how much um, material is in those drives, how much manufacturing goes into them, and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, in, in some ways, uh, DNA storage has a, a, a simplicity to offer there versus, um, versus conventional storage. Um, yeah, you just think about the, the data centers that are out there, the amount of energy going into them and um, that's a whole separate conversation, but still. I think that um, this is a really, this is kind of a continuation of the conversation going on in um, research data storage. Um, in that we, you know, tiering the data into, you know, for example, cloud storage, you know, you have hot storage, Glacier, et cetera. This almost seems like a continuation of Glacier in that it's less accessible. It is, um, it's more stable potentially. I'm, forgive me, I graduated relatively recently, um, but, um, I think that despite the the drawbacks of DNA storage, which there are, you know, clearly a lot of that we've had in this conversation alone, um, it seems like kind of the ultimate way to preserve history and preserve something that is not going to change, which is something that has already happened. It's almost it's it's very philosophical. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm I'm really in, interested in this topic. This is the first time I'm actually hearing about it. So
right? It, it definitely definitely makes you. I mean, I, I'm in similar shoes. Like, um, you know, when when Ewan was at our last meeting and he was actually talking about, you know, them getting into, you know, just trying the the technology and um, <clears throat> just seeing the initial results and everything. I think it's, yeah, it's kind of like um, it's like the the bleeding edge there and not everybody has a chance to do that. Um, so <clears throat> it's great to see that it, op it opens your eyes to the possibilities and also all the risks and everything as well. Um, so yeah, I, I actually, I think I remember him saying that they may have their data sequenced by yeah. November or something, right? Yeah, well, so I, I think it was possible by this meeting, but uh, yeah. hopefully he'll, he'll let us know when they've had a chance to do that. Yeah, yeah, um, and I'll, I'll before November when we get together, I'll, I'll reach out to him and see if he uh, if he could join us at that point. If there's uh, if they've sequenced it by then, I'll be need to walk through. I mean, definitely block out some time. Yeah, certainly at a thirty thousand foot view, Quinn. To to your point, I think at a you know high level view of this it's certainly and also eric to your point in terms of energy efficiency it uh it definitely it's something that i want to think will eventually work out the kinks because it definitely seems like a, a real answer to the problem of storage but you know as we've been talking about there definitely are challenges uh to work out and questions to be answered you wouldn't know that the first thing that i watched was the twist video of course, there was lots of confidence on display in that video. So uh, that I think is the 30,000 foot view. But yeah, looking at some of the other questions that come up when you start thinking about it, hopefully, hopefully those questions will get answered. Yeah, you have to love the uh, the analog that um, that was in that video to the the mammoth bone. I think it was that was just buried in dirt for yeah yeah <laughs> tens of thousands of years, and then being able to extract DNA, extract DNA from there, and um, actually getting a a sequence from it, and um, yeah. Um, one would think that any of the safeguards we put in place in terms of storing uh you know the samples that are created uh would would well outlast that but yeah then then again you never know were there other aspects of the videos or the paper that really made people think about this in a different way or brought out questions that you hadn't thought of before i'd be curious if there's anybody who'd like to talk about that so this kind of sent me into a philosophical direction thinking about like our server storage and if I'm really any more confident in it than the DNA, like that if I had the math, like they were giving us about the errors, yeah. would I, you know, am I really more confident in my ability to understand what the server is doing than I am with DNA sequencing? Or is this all an illusion? And do I not really understand what's going on in the storage medium regardless? which actually made me think maybe I should be a little more open to this sort of thing, you know, that whatever storage we're doing realistically does have a couple of layers between us, you know, like vendor knowledge layers or technology layers between us and the thing. And so is it really that different if it's biological as opposed to, you know, the magnetic and, and would the DNA be a nice supplement, you know, especially thinking you know, we're a born digital archives. Our intent is to maintain the files in the form we receive them as well as migrate them. So if we had a place super stable like DNA to put the old versions, we could focus our more expensive active management on whatever the current version is and let everybody else hang tight on DNA just in case we needed them. So yeah. I could see where it could be useful. Yeah, I had sort of the same kind of thought when I was the first question that I asked in terms of what what is this? What does it look like? And and then it it occurred to me as I was thinking about that that do I know that much more about what I'm used to using? <laughs> and the only difference is the familiarity. <laughs> that actually brings up another thought, which is uh, so much capital has been expended in just building data centers designed to keep servers cool and disks cool and whatnot. And I wonder how much of that could be repurposed for this if a cloud provider wanted to get into the game. Yeah. Presumably they would have to. I don't know. Maybe they would just build new facilities. Who knows? 
Um, on the subject of like magnetic disk reliability though, I think the difference is that's been researched for many decades yeah. and there's a lot of really, really good research on it. So yeah. this is new technology that hasn't been done yet. Yeah, talking to Linda in particular, both listening to her, her presentation on this and then um, having her talk about the environmental impact of digital preservation, it makes me wonder if there will come a time when there really is no option because we will have exhausted rare earth metals and things like that, that, um, that our current scenarios depend on. Right, at that point, it feels like a tremendous environmental impact, but then it also feels uh, like if, if we do get to that point, we'll be in big trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, not only, yeah, it's like I, right. You, you, it's, uh, what's the right, it's humbling to start thinking yeah. in that direction, yeah. Or even if it's not a matter of complete scarcity, if it's a matter of enough scarcity that the cost becomes unbearable um, and that something like DNA storage becomes looking more and more attractive. Mm -hmm. All right. Or dye, if the whole dye uh, storage for some reason is a better option. I had not heard of that until it was just mentioned, but. Um, there are some more, more comments that folks have uh, posted in the chat. Um, Sybil mentioned, um, I'm uneasy about a storage mechanism that allows for such tight control over access. Think of how easily an, an authoritative government can control DNA sequencing and thus access to any materials encoded within, right? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a very good and somewhat frightening point, um, but that could happen. Um, and then from Jason, will DNA storage change how we approach queries and computing? Years ago, I read an article about how the, the traveling salesman problem was solved almost instantly in DNA. Right? I mean, it's when you, when you start thinking about a storage facility that is so disruptive and such a huge change in comparison to what we're used to. Um, yeah, I mean, how will it also alter computing and alter access, alter our methodologies for? handling anything with, you know, that surrounds it, all that sort of thing. Um, and I mean, it could have broader implications as well. Like if, if there is really the crisis of storage that's spelled out as the crux of, of the article that we read, um, and there's actual capital that flows into sequencing and synthesis at the speeds that we would need. Can you imagine what impact that would have for being able to sequence or, or work with DNA and other sectors beyond um, storage? Because I mean, actually being able to do this at a computational scale and speed would mean that you could do a lot more in other areas that people may or may not be really comfortable with when it comes to DNA. Um, but this could very well drive those areas in, in real fundamental ways. Right. And you have to, that's a really good point. I mean, it, you have to think about, um, you know, industries that do and don't play well together. And, um, you know, whether or not our, uh, you know, this kind of niche industry of digital preservation, um, how it will be influenced by the technologies that are that are introduced by other industries. Um, you, know, you can frame that in so many different ways, whether it's a, you know from an academic standpoint, whether it's from um, you know a private industry or um, you know and anything like that. You you really have to think of how 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 different industries will, will really influence each other and either, you know, kind of send us, you know, way down the road or, you know, end up creating drawbacks and problems for, for us in one way or another. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the government issue that uh, Sybil and Cal are talking about right now in chat. So...
So we're, we are at, at 10 of, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to once again ask, as Leah had asked, is there, are there other thoughts, other aspects that folks want to want to mention? And we've had a, a lot of great ones mentioned already. Okay. All right, let's see. Um, got lots of great notes going on too. Um, thanks everyone for taking notes. I'll look through real quick. Okay. Um, Leah, is there anything else you want to, to mention? I guess we're uh, gonna kind of- Well, yeah. one reminder that we didn't make at the top of the hour was that DigiPrez registration is still open. And so if you want to attend the conference on November 4th, please go ahead and register. And I can put that in the chat as well. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of uh, effort to try to include as much as possible in the, in the day that DigiPrez happens, multiple tracks, different topics. It's gonna be, I think it'll be really great. Um, really looking forward to it. So yeah, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, start wrapping it up. Um, so thank you everyone for, uh, yeah, definitely a great conversation. And um, we'll look forward to maybe hearing from you in next month. Uh, hope to see you all there. And then also we'll uh, kind of uh, prepare for the conversation that um, my presentation we mentioned earlier about trying to uh, build some transparency into repository. So great. Okay, well, thanks everyone.